de Circle College Tour nemen jullie mee in relevante thema's die gaan over de transitie naar een duurzame en een circulaire economie. Waar wij praten hier op de Zuidas met wetenschappers en deskundigen over alles wat met die transitie te maken heeft. Ik dacht dat ik al het een en ander wist over dit thema, maar ik kom erachter dat ik er eigenlijk helemaal niet van begrijp. Welcome to uh, another episode of the Circle College Tour um, with the team uh, from sustainability to thriving. Um, live from Circle in Amsterdam, the platform for the transition or the, the, the acceleration of the transition for the circle economy, um, a circular economy. My name is Kees Klomp. I'm a uh, professor of applied science at the Rotterdam University of Applied Science, and I am your moderator for tonight. And um, my guest is uh, uh, Professor Dr. Wayne Fisser. Uh, and well, well, Wayne, I have you, I have, you have a, such a long, <laughs> uh, wonderful CV uh, that I have to uh, look a bit uh, in my, uh, my notes. You're a fellow um, lecturer and head tutor of Cambridge University for Sustainable Leadership. You're also a chair and professor and director of the Sustainable Transformation um, at the Antwerp Management School. You wrote 41 books. My God. <laughs> I've, I've written six and that, that was already... <laughs> 41 books. Uh, and you have 30 year uh, experience in the field of sustainability and, uh, and, and transformation. Um, and tonight we're going to focus on the, your last publication, the book Thriving, with the subtitle The Breakthrough Movement to Regenerate Nature, Society and the Economy. Wonderful title, very hopeful. <laughs> um, question. I, um, you might not be uh, aware of this, but you were one of the first things I come across with every morning. <laughs> I'm a subscriber to your uh, uh, newsletter. Um, the Purpose Inspired Daily Reflection. Uh, Wayne has a, a, a subscription uh, offer where he shares some wisdom every day. Um, and today, um, your message was about biomass. The fact that the Earth's total uh, living biomass exceeds 1.1 trillion tons that is yeah that's just a lot <laughs> well uh, great pleasure to be with you and with all of you um, the interesting thing there is uh, just a year or two ago the anthropogenic mass in other words the mass of everything that we've made as humans the stuff that we've made exceeded the biomass of the earth. So the, the weight of all the living things on the earth were exceeded by the stuff that we've artificially manufactured. And uh, as we also know, more than 90% of that is not circular, is not being recycled. It's basically waste piling up. So uh, yeah, it's worth pondering. You know, nature, uh, nature deals with all of that mass. It, it, it regenerates itself, but uh, so far, All of our stuff is not regenerated. Now it's a bit of a bit of a challenge. <laughs> yeah. um, just before we go uh, to to listen to your uh, lecture of today, and after this lecture, we have half an hour for Q and A. So mm -hmm. people at home, if you want to ask uh, Wayne any questions or make remarks, uh, please do. You can uh, you can do that via the chat. Uh, and also, folks, for over here, if you have any questions or uh, remarks after the talk, please uh, raise your hand or make yourself heard and, um, and, sh and share our talk here on, on, uh, on stage. Um, maybe j just one question before you, uh, you move in that uh, direction. Um, what is the most important difference between sustainability and thriving? Well, that is the essence of my, my presentation, but if you think about it, to sustain is just to continue. Yes. It's about survival, it's about endurance, and we need to do that, but that shouldn't be our purpose. To thrive is to go beyond that. Uh, it's a little bit like the difference between breathing and having a purpose in life. Of course, we need to breathe, we want to survive, 
but that's not why we exist. And so that's one of the reasons I'm a bit critical of sustainability, having worked on that for more than 30 years. I think now we need to aim higher because uh, so far, by aiming just to continue, we're falling far short. Yeah, the next level. Yeah. The floor is yours. Thank you and, so much. Uh, Well, thank you everyone for, for being here, for joining us online and in person. Uh, as mentioned, I want to talk about going beyond sustainability to thriving. And this is a breakthrough movement to regenerate nature, society and the economy. Um, and you might immediately say, why thriving? Why beyond sustainability? And having worked now for more than 30 years in sustainability, I can tell you a few things. The first is that it's still not clear, believe it or not. If I ask different people what they mean by sustainability, I still get different answers. We now have 17 sustainable development goals and I'm not sure that's making it any clearer. The second thing is that it's not working. Even though we have more than ever before activity on sustainability, still as I'm gonna show you in a few minutes, we see many trends still heading in the wrong direction. So something is amiss. The last thing is that it's not inspiring, right? Do you wake up in the morning and turn to your partner and say, let's have a sustainable relationship? Probably not. Uh, or, or probably if you do, you may not be in that relationship too much longer. Why? Because we want something more. If you said we want a thriving relationship, we want a thriving family, a thriving community or school, or city, or country, or company. We know what that means. We know that's something more. That's something that's inspiring, and we desperately need inspiration today. I like the way that, um, that Sir David Attenborough puts it. He says, if we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural horizon is of the world is on the horizon. And then the key, in this world, a species can only thrive when everything around it also thrives. We can solve the problems we now face by embracing this reality. That's the difference, and that's the missing thing that we haven't had in the last few years. We've acted as if having a thriving company is enough, or having a thriving economy over here is enough, without taking into account that everything needs to thrive. So why do I say that uh, it's not working? Well. Let's first face the fact that business is in a crisis of trust. Some research done by Cranfield University shows that when you ask current and future leaders, in other words, incumbent leaders and younger leaders, does business have a clear social purpose? Nine out of 10 current leaders say yes. They're patting themselves on the back. We're doing a great job. Only two out of 10 of the younger leaders believe that business is fulfilling a social purpose. There's a massive expectations and generations gap. In fact, 56% of people today believe that capitalism is doing more harm than good. In fact, the issue here is not that business is not competent. In fact, uh, the research suggests that we believe that business is competent, but unethical. NGOs, civil society, on the other hand, we believe is ethical, but less competent. And so there's nobody in that sweet spot of competent and ethical. So, some facts and figures to justify why I say that sustainability isn't working until now. Let's start with a small number, five. This is the number of times in the last five years that climate and weather has been the most severe risk as rated, according to the World Economic Forum, leaders every year. So that's the top issue. 41 is the percentage of people with LGBTQ preference that have left a job because of bullying, feeling that they're being discriminated against, and most of them still stay undisclosed for that very reason. 69, I always take a deep breath before I share this, because the fact of the matter is it took us 3.8 billion years to build up the life on this planet, and it's taken us just 50 years to wipe out more than two thirds of that life. Also insects in sharp decline as an indicator of that. 
151. This is the number of years it will take to close the gender pay gap, and that's still sitting globally at 40%. These are issues we think we're making progress on, but this is in no way acceptable in today's age. 320. We talk a lot about inequality in the world, but how can we get inequality in the world when inequality goes up every year in our companies? 320 is the average CEO to worker pay. In 1960, it was 20 to 1. If you work for Amazon today, it's more than 6,000 to 1. Let's look at some bigger numbers. 100 million is the number of people forced from their homes in the last year. More than half of that within their own countries. And this is not even taking into account climate refugees, which will become 200 million by 2050. And notice as well that uh, this is more than double what it was 10 years ago. 636 million, well, this is a moving target. This is the number of COVID cases still going up, of course, more than 6 million people who have died uh, in the past few years. 280 billion. This is the cost each year of natural catastrophes, floods, fires, droughts. And uh, notice as well that not only is this claiming lives, but less than half of these are insured. Yeah, so you have people's lives being devastated in, in the millions and having no help to get back on their feet. 2.6 trillion. The numbers are getting big now. This is the global cost of corruption every year. 5% of global GDP. A trillion dollars paid in bribes every year. And 6 trillion the cost of cyber crime every year. And in fact, that's gone up 600% during the COVID crisis. So this is the state of our world. And what it suggests to us is that we're getting major shocks to our global system. And if the shocks are small, the system can absorb it. But if they are, are big, then the system gets unstable. And either the system breaks down, it falls apart literally, or it breaks through. It evolves to something higher, something better functioning. And that is really our choice. And you'll see on this chart that there is a decision window, a time period when it matters what choices we make. That's why when we talk about this critical decade for climate change, we're not just making that up. That's a systemic fact. It's based on the science. Because if we leave it too late, then there's too much momentum in the system and there's not too much we can do to change it. So the way that I like to talk about going beyond sustainability is really how do we turn these breakdowns that we're seeing into breakthroughs, into opportunities. And I talk about six great transitions to thriving. I'm going to give lots of examples of these, but let's just put them on the map to start with. The first is how do we go from degradation of ecosystems to restoration? And we do that through an eco-services economy. How do we go from depletion of resources to renewal through a circular economy? How do we go from disparity, inequality in society and in our workplaces to responsibility through an access economy? How do we go from disease to revitalization through a well-being economy? From disconnection of technology to rewiring through a digital economy? And from disruption to resilience through a risk economy? So let's bring these six transitions alive now. Firstly, let's deal with degradation to restoration. Well, there are many things that we can do. We might just start, uh, in fact, we could start with this wonderful building here, Circle in, in, in Amsterdam. We look outside, it's got green walls. Uh, this is part of the solution, is how we make our buildings today, how we construct our cities. This is the new Google head office, busy being constructed in London. It has a park on the roof, more than 320 meters long. Uh, this park will have more biodiversity on it than the surrounding countryside. We already know this from green roofs in London. That should also tell you something about the agricultural system that we have in the world today. And if we look to companies like Danone, I could equally mention Nestle. These are companies that have realized that we have essentially spent 50 to 100 years killing the soil, wiping out biodiversity through farming, and now we need to convert to regenerative agriculture. And there's some real ambition in the plans of these companies. Others are joining uh, natural capital coalitions, 
finding the link between business and biodiversity, committing to the One Trillion Trees program of the World Economic Forum. There's a meeting later on this year in Montreal where we're trying to get a Paris-like agreement on biodiversity. So watch that space, it's absolutely critical. What about on resources? How do we go from depletion to renewal of resources? Well, I love this case. Uh, this is uh, a, a woman in the foreground here who I've met in Borneo, in Malaysia, and uh, she's an illiterate grandmother. She doesn't read or write. And uh, she uh, goes to India, and within six months, she goes to Barefoot College, and she gets trained to be a solar engineer. She then goes back, she goes back to her village having been trained to be a solar engineer and installs a full solar lighting system for her village of 100 households. What an amazing story, all the barriers that are being broken there, but of course in the end bringing renewables to those places where it's most needed. By the way, they don't train young people because they'll just go to the cities instead of the rural areas. This is a company, uh, Yumicor, actually just down the road from the work I do in Antwerp. And it used to be a Belgian mining company with operations all around the world. And uh, today it does no mining, but it does do urban mining. In fact, it's the world's biggest precious metals recycler in the world. It takes back our laptops, our phones and industrial waste and extracts gold and platinum and other precious metals. A very successful uh, and circular business model. We can take many other examples. This is a company, Algix, that uses algae to create 3D printing filament that they can then use in various applications. Or in the construction industry, Biomason actually grows bricks from bacteria and other things. It does that at, at room temperature, much lower carbon footprint, very lightweight materials. We call this living concrete. So lots of innovation happening in this space. What about then moving from uh, discrimination or disparity to uh, access, to responsibility? Well, we, we need to look for the leaders in diversity and inclusion. And Hermes, the fashion brand, is one of those that has been going further than others in Europe. You might recognize a few of the other logos there, uh, Microsoft, Expedia, Armani, and so on. Or we could look at this example. This is Hamdi Ulakaya the founder and CEO of Chobani, which is the biggest Greek yogurt brand in the United States. He's a Turkish uh, migrant, and he makes sure that his workforce is as diverse as possible. He, he mainly employs migrants and refugees, and as a result, he's also uh, become a UN ambassador for that. Hello Tractor is basically Uber for tractors. If you're in East Africa, then uh, if you have a tractor and your neighbor farmer doesn't, you get them to sign up to the app and for a very small charge, they can have access to your tractor. So suddenly they're part of the economy, they have productivity and they're included. What about uh, the health stories? Well, HP we know for their laptops, but they're also a medical technology company. One of the projects they have is to kit out shipping containers with all the medical equipment that's needed for a clinic. They, trip and they, 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 they ship and truck that to wherever it's needed in the world, in this case, India. Then a local health worker can work with the community, take people's heart uh, pulse, take people's blood, and then link up with doctors in the United States uh, virtually to get diagnoses. Or look at this uh, fetal heart rate monitor. What's special about this made by a company Freeplay is it requires no electricity. It doesn't even require batteries. It's using wind-up technology. So now any community that's off the grid somewhere in a rural area in the world can have this technology. Or at the bottom, this is a, from General Electric. This is an ultrasound uh, machine. This used to be a massive piece of equipment that cost tens of thousands of dollars. Only the richest hospitals could afford it. Today it's a handheld device and it costs about $150. What about our diets? There is a health story here because research according to Oxford University suggests that moving to more plant-based diets could reduce premature mortality, in other words, dying before we should, by 20% globally. So we need to make this shift 
for good environmental reasons as well, of course. Uh, Plant-based diets are 80 to 90 percent less environmental impact. What about technologies? Well, sometimes technology doesn't have to be high-tech. You might still remember these old Nokia phones. Well, this is the kind of phone that many farmers still use around the world. So we farm connects them all together in a network, a little bit like a WhatsApp group. Let's say a farmer in Argentina discovers a disease on, on her crop. She can take a picture of that, share it with the global network. Somebody in Vietnam said, I've seen that disease before. This is how I treated it. Solution is suddenly shared. Of course, it can be high tech. This is provenance in the UK. This uses blockchain technology to ensure the track and traceability of sustainability claims right throughout the value chain. In this case, for fish, but they do it for clothing, they do it for gold and many other uh, sectors. Of course, we can go very high tech. Uh, this is Zen Robotics, and they have a robot now that sorts mixed waste with 98% accuracy into the recycling uh, elements. And so uh, we can start taking the human error and the human effort out of that. And then how about dealing with disruption, with all the crises we face? Well, this is Planet Labs, and every, world they image, every day they image the world in detail with uh, low-orbit satellites. It's basically Google Earth updated every single day. Why is that important for resilience? Well, you can just about make out on this picture, you can do time lapses. So let's say there's illegal logging happening, deforestation. You can pick that up now within days or weeks and make an intervention. And these are critical technologies now. Or in this case, this is uh, the earthquake that was uh, in Haiti uh, about uh, 10 years ago, devastating, more than 200,000 people died. A little tech startup in Africa called Ushahidi responded to that crisis. They created a platform and an app where victims like this could send a text and say what they needed. Uh, that geolocated them on the map, identified where they were, but also they crowdsourced everyone in the world who speaks Creole to rapidly translate those texts and get them to the aid agencies, get the equipment to where it's needed. Of course, you may have seen in the news recently Patagonia making some very big moves. They've always been a leader, but under their founder, Ivan Chenard, they now put the company into a trust. And so now this company that's more than a billion dollar company has to, by law now, reinvest all of its profits to tackling climate change. I mean, this is an investment in our future resilience. Now, how do companies deal with all of these transitions? Uh, in the book Thriving, there's a whole chapter on, on how I've worked with companies to implement this, and it's all about integration. I'm not going to go into this in detail today, we don't have time, but essentially it's, it's working through these steps of having a systems thinking uh, period, then really looking at partnerships and stakeholder engagement, having another look at your values and principles and whether you live them, looking at your purpose and whether you have ambitious goals, and then, of course, the uh, metrics around performance, and there's such a lot of work going on there right now, very exciting. And finally, looking at your portfolio and, and saying, are we innovating to be inherently part of the solution rather than part of the problem? I wanted to rather bring it alive with one case study. You may be familiar with them, but this is Ørsted, a Danish company that used to be an oil and gas company, pretty mainstream. That's how they made their money. And within 13 years, they made a transformation to become one of the world's leading offshore wind companies. Now, how did they do that? Uh, the amazing thing is that they changed their investment patterns. So after investing more or less equally in renewables and oil and gas. They radically reduced their investments in oil and gas, radically increased to 99% their investment in renewables. As a result, no surprise, their share of green energy markets went up, their uh, uh, carbon emissions down radically. This is the kind of business transformation we need. They have a wonderful publication where they, they they share the lessons they've learned in that very hard but very inspiring transition. 
I just wanted to highlight a few very quickly. Lesson one is you've got to confront the reality of a changing landscape. We know we've got to get to net zero. We know we've got to phase out fossil fuels. So why mess around? Why not just get in there and be bold and make that transition? Similar to what Tesla did. Tesla could have made a hybrid. They investigated that. But then they said, well, why would we do that? The solution is electric. It performs better. Let's just go straight to the solution. Toyota, I think, has got into this trap of being in the middle. Define a sustainable vision. Well, I think uh, uh, the classic there is Unilever's sustainable living plan, which uh, was, was incredible under Paul Pullman. Um, engage with those stakeholders, and there's lots of work around stakeholder materiality that we can draw on there, but really listen. Uh, and then uh, mobilize behind your vision. Uh, I've highlighted here the work that's going on in biodiversity because I think this is where we're, we're really miles behind. We're probably 10 or maybe even 20 years behind where we were on climate change, where we are now. We just haven't made that link between biodiversity and business, and, and, and we really need to. So, so let's have a vision now for what is the vision of, of likely to come out of Montreal, 30% protection of, uh, of uh, land and oceans by 2030, uh, and 50% protected by uh, 2050. And then drive tangible action. I put BASF here, up here, not because they're a perfect uh, company, they're also one of my chair partners, but they're making massive investments into all kinds of technologies around uh, green ammonia, around carbon capture, around uh, chemical recycling, and so on. And then expect uh, exponential change. You know, a lot of people got caught out when, when, when suddenly we went against plastics. Well, we knew plastics were a problem, but we thought that forevermore we would just live with them. And then, then it started to change, and when it started to change, it was very rapid. We had documentaries suddenly. We had Boyan Slat, that uh, young entrepreneur with his ocean cleanup. And suddenly the, the UN was all over this. They included plastics in their uh, Basel Convention in a very short period of time. Then the, the EU got in with their plastic strategy. All happened much faster than people thought. So expect exponential change. And go the distance. Here I've just highlighted the Rana Plaza tragedy of a few years ago in textiles. You know, this is a major setback, but it focused our attention. And now we have to keep going. We have to keep improving, uh, the, in this case, the textiles industry. But uh, the same goes for all industries. Now, the other thing I highlight in the book and, and won't go into much detail now is, is, is the kind of leaders that we need, because we need leaders with different characteristics. This is based on uh, work that was done uh, at Cambridge University that I've been involved in, but also uh, at Antwerp uh, Management School. So we need leaders that can think in systems, that can be inclusive, that can, can, can show that they're caring, demonstrate that, that can think and, and act long term, strategically, that have moral courage and that uh, embrace uh, innovation. Again, I really want to bring it alive with, uh, with the case now. It's a, it's a classic case, but um, you know, Interface's journey to net zero, which was a 25-year journey. Again, they got a wonderful report where they capture the lessons. And, and first they say, there is space for change. Uh, you can change more than you think as a business. Start where people are at. Here I put the meat-free Mondays. I mean, I'm a vegan for five years, a vegetarian for 30 years. Uh, we have to make this transition to plant-based. But start where people are at, right? If it just means giving up beef once a week, that's the place you start. It can really make a difference. Don't put the burden only on ethical consumers. For so many years, we've said, if only you shop differently, the world will be fine. Actually, you have to choice edit. And I put B&Q up there because it's one of the things they did very early was to say, if you shop at this uh, DIY store, uh, mainly in the UK, it's a bit like an IKEA you will only buy sustainably certified wood. Uh, we don't give you the choice anymore. Um, show people that there's something, uh, part of something bigger. I love the Dove self-esteem campaign. Look it up if you're not familiar with it. But, you know, make your brands about something more than just, uh, you know, being uh, a widget or something that you consume or something that you sell. Develop the tools and momentum to tackle more difficult issues. 
we face some really tough issues. I mean, this is the Black Lives Matter issue. Uh, Apple was one of the companies, Nike another one, that, that took it head on and started to have these very hard conversations within their companies about whether they're uh, really supporting the right things. Now, uh, I'm often asked then, how do we know whether solutions are moving us in the right direction or not? So I've distilled this into six scientific principles. These are the keys to thriving, and I find they're useful in testing any solutions, products, strategies, or initiatives we might have. So let me try and bring them alive for you. The first is complexity. In complex living systems, complexity is a good thing. It's about the relationships. It's about networks. It's like the web, right? So if you take a complex system like an ant colony, uh, this is a, a very complex social system, right? They're out there defending the nest. They're foraging for food. They're growing mushrooms underground. They're feeding the queen. She's not the leader, by the way. She just lays eggs. Uh, they take out the trash. They bury the dead. All of this is happening without a leader. Because the amazing thing about complex systems is you get self-organization and you get a phenomenon called emergence. You get creativity coming just because there is this, uh, uh, this network effect. So always ask, is this thing that I'm doing or proposing, is it increasing the network effect? Am I connecting more people, more parties, more collaboration? I think a nice example is Port of Antwerp Bruges, another one of my chair partners. They have a, a strategy now to be a green hub uh, for energy for the future. And this is connecting energy from around the world, as far as Mozambique, for example, or, uh, or Namibia, where they'll be getting green ammonia or getting renewables from other parts of the world and, and just being the center for that, being the, the spider in the web. Uh, now, the other key is circularity. In life, everything is designed in cycles. Huh? So uh, I, I've said already, we're a deeply linear economy right now, uh, and we still have a long way to go. So for those who are interested in this topic, I was involved in co-producing and presenting this uh, documentary, Closing the Loop. Uh, we filmed in Latin America, Africa, and Europe, finding case studies of what people are doing, what companies are doing on circular economy. It's on YouTube, uh, free to view now, so uh, check it out. Just to give you an example from that documentary, this is the second largest remanufacturing plant in the world. It happens to be in South Africa. It's where they take back Caterpillar earth-moving equipment. They take back the parts before they fail, and they refurbish them. They repair them. They remanufacture them, and then they send them back. Now, this saves the customer between 20 and 60 percent. It also saves massive amounts of materials. Think of all the steel. Think of all the energy that gets saved as a result. So always the question is, is my solution, my proposal, my strategy, is it increasing circularity or is it propping up and continuing the linear take-make-waste economy? Now, the other key is creativity. And in complex living systems, Creativity is directly linked to diversity. Now, this is a shocking chart here because it asked populations of countries of the world, do you want more gender equality and do you want more ethnic diversity? And the answer to all of this should be yes, yes, yes. And what you see is that there are many countries that don't want more of this, even those that we think of as progressive companies that want countries that want more gender equality don't necessarily want more ethnic diversity. This is a huge mistake because we know that if you want innovation, if you want creativity, you need to embrace diversity and inclusion. And in fact, there's even research to suggest that tracks through to revenues. And of course, the young people today want to work for companies that are inclusive and diverse. Now, the fourth key is coherence. Uh, systems thrive when they have a common purpose. This is the phenomenon of murmuration you see here, starlings flocking together. Again, interestingly, they don't have a leader, by the way. In fact, this has been applied to social systems, and it's been found that you only need between 5 and 25 percent of an aligned minority to move a whole crowd in a particular direction. So it's not that we have to convince everybody. What we need is the coherence of the purpose. Now, I think the Sustainable Development Goals, for all of their uh, weaknesses that they have, 
are one example of a common purpose where we can all align behind. And we don't actually have to be coordinated with everybody else. We don't have to be working directly together. We just need to be moving in the same direction. An example here, uh, I mean, I, I put beyond meat here because this is an example of a company that's crystal clear about what their purpose is. They realized that they ne we need to shift the, the, the food system, and the way to do that is not to convince everybody to uh, eat carrots, or as many people call it, uh, rabbit food, but rather to create alternatives that taste great and that for those that like their meat, taste like meat. So they're just crystal clear in their purpose, and, and they've been very successful, and of course they have massively less impacts. Now, Another key is convergence. What you see here on, on the screen, on the left is a city, uh, New York City in fact, a street in 1900. And where the red arrow is, is a single motor car. The rest are all horse-drawn carriages. In 1913, you see the same street, it's all motor cars and one single horse-drawn carriage. The entire transport system of a major city in the world flipped within 13 years. This is the phenomenon of convergence. This is what happens when trends reinforce one another. We call it, in living systems theory, we call it positive feedback loops. And we see many examples in the world today. Policy developments are reinforcing technology breakthroughs, which are reinforcing social pressure from movements like climate strike, which are reinforced by market opportunities. I mean, we could just take the one example of clean energy. Despite the spike that we're seeing in fossil fuel consumption right now due to the war uh, in, in Ukraine, fossil fuels are in a carbon bubble. They will collapse much quicker than people think, and renewables will explode much faster, uh, grow much faster than people think, and it's because of all the reinforcing trends. They're already the cheapest source of energy everywhere in the world, new electricity. And, and what you see is renewables is being reinforced by the battery technology, which is being reinforced by the artificial intelligence technology. All of this is uh, causing a growth in electric vehicles. Again, this will happen much faster than people think. Um, so look out for these trends where the acceleration curves are, are very, very strong. So how can you add your voice to these convergences? The last principle is continuity. How can we ensure that we act for the long term? We're under such pressure for the short term. Well, research by McKinsey suggests that actually companies that have a long-term orientation perform better financially in terms of earnings, revenue, market capitalization, and job creation. So it's a myth that we have to be short-term focused in order to make better profits or revenues or, or returns. But what we need is a strength of will and leadership to say we're going to invest in the long term, even if we face short-term crises. By the way, did you know that even in the midst of this crisis with the, with the energy prices and the, everybody scrambling for, for, for fossil fuels, 19 countries have increased their commitments on renewable energies since the war began. Uh, uh, that's just in Europe since the war began in Ukraine. So this is actually accelerating our transition. Now, to start to draw to a close, the, the question is, can we change this picture this is the answer we get when we speak to uh, experts around the world, sustainability experts, and we say, who is contributing the most to sustainability? And you can see the private sector does not perform very well. In fact, we put our trust in research organizations, NGOs, mass movements, social movements. And yet, when we ask this, the, the same group the question, who should be leading on sustainability? Where is our hope? Who can actually make this transition as fast as we need it? There you see the private sector is actually very high. So this is a, a dilemma that we have to solve. Uh, and it's, it's squarely in the, in the court of business to take up that challenge. So how do we uh, adopt thriving and why is it so important? Well, I think one of the things we have to realize is that there's a real crisis of hope right now in the world. If you speak especially to young people, there's a lot of despair there. 
And uh, it's really what we call the Stockdale Paradox. Yeah? Admiral Stockdale was a, a naval uh, admiral who, who lived for seven years through a, a, a prisoner of war camp in Vietnam. How did he survive? He said, well, I had to face the brutal reality of my uh, facts that were in front of me, but never give up hope that things could change. In fact, things will change. That's the one thing we can be sure of. But we can be part of that change. And so hope comes from adopting a thriving mindset. Thriving is a way of being in the world. And it's, it affirms life. Life is designed to thrive. We just have to get out of the way. We have to stop the barriers. We have to stop the damage to life and just allow it to happen. It's a more effective way to be a change agent. If you're caught up in the problems, you can't be very effective. And of course, it's already happening. Literally hundreds of examples in the book and just thousands of innovations happening right now that are speeding our way towards thriving. But hope is not something passive. And I love this quote from Rebecca Solnit, a beautiful book on social movements called Hope in the Dark. She says, hope is not a lottery ticket you can sit on the sofa and clutch feeling lucky. It is an ax you break down doors with in an emergency. To hope is to give yourself to the future, and that commitment to the future is what makes the present inhabitable. And to that I would add, hope is a scarce but completely renewable resource. We have as much of it as we want to create. So let me end then with some creative words. This is a poem of mine called A Place to Thrive. It's a challenge to us all. Is the world a better place because we lived and loved and learned? What will our children have to face because of what we built and burned? Are people better than before because we gave them dignity? What happened to the sick and poor while we were living strong and free? Is the world a fairer place because we fought for equal rights? Who lost for us to win our race? Or did we open up new heights? Is nature thriving, great and small, because we walked upon the earth? Did oceans rise and species fall with every breath we took since birth? Is the world a dying place because our enterprises grew? Did we destroy our living space or did we seed the world anew? Each day we get to use our voice to raise the tide or let it ebb. Each day we face a simple choice to nurture life or fray its web. Let's let the world be better still for every moment we're alive because we choose to use our will to make our earth a place to thrive. Thank you very much. We welcome you, welcome you back on the stage. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, oh, <laughs> microphone. Oh. That, that was a lot, Wayne. <laughs> Damn, that was a roller coaster. Roller coaster. Um, thank you very much, first and foremost, um, and, as, and, and especially for the the very very hopeful, um, the, the, the very hopeful narrative that really resonates. So uh, let, let's start with that. <laughs> yep. It's really important. We need it, right? We need it. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's a, that, that slide for, for the last slide with hope that is just awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Um, I would, uh, I would like. Uh, we have lots of questions, and I'm sure that people over here have questions as well. But um, if I might be so bold to ask the first question. <laughs> um, I was really intrigued by the uh, the slide you showed me with the the global scan uh, presentation yeah. with the low uh, esteem of the private sector and the um, uh, national governments because the national governments were even scoring lower <laughs> and on the other side people had m bigger expectations of the national uh, governments than the yeah. private sector yeah. um, where where do you put your hope and money <laughs> Do you expect more from the private sector or from the government? Or maybe both. 
Well, I put my hope in the system, right? This, this wouldn't be a surprise. Uh, my, my hope is entirely by understanding that we're an interconnected system of which the national governments are a part, but also the local governments and the city governments. Mm. But also, uh, you know, business is a part. And, and, and actually, I put more and more emphasis on civil society and the social movements that are putting pressure. Um, I do think there are a lot of places where national politics is pretty broken, right? And yet still we see the pressure rising. Uh, we see that, uh, you know, uh, even when the politics is, is, is pushing, let's say, in the wrong direction, still the pressure to start doing the right thing is there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think the system is changing. What's interesting is when the norms of society change, in other words, what we collectively believe is right, then all the parts of the system change to align. Nobody wants to be left behind. Hmm. I experienced this in South Africa, right? I lived through that transition from apartheid to democracy. Hmm. Yeah. Now, we first have to realize there was 40 years of resistance, fighting against it, you know, those in power, clinging to power, even violent resistance. We see the same thing going on right now with those in power, with the incumbent industries, oil and gas and others. You know, and, and it's a fight. For sure it's a fight. But when the change happens, it happens very quickly. And then the norms have changed. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you can't find anybody who supported that previous mm -hmm. way of being anymore. So, so really my hope is in the system. But uh, I think where the most movement is, if we talk about governments, is at the city level and at the local level, where okay. there's more control, um, but supported by social movements. And then we have to put our hope in business because yeah. business has the ability to move fast, to scale, to innovate. Um, but again, we have to give them the direction. Uh, uh, business, in a way, is agnostic. They don't care how they make their money, um, but uh, they need to have that clear purpose or expectation. Yeah. But also, so there's also an, encourage, an encouragement for, well, let's say, the, 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 the kids that are quite disappointed by the the cop the last cop in Egypt uh, so you know to, the resist keep the resisting go uh, resistance going is also important to yeah. to change the culture to yeah. change the system yeah I mean this is a marathon not a sprint and yeah we expect the resistance I think cop uh, in Egypt cop 27 was two steps forward one step back yeah uh, I mean two steps forward because the agreement on loss and damage, absolutely critical. I mean, this is the justice part of the climate transition that we need, right? The energy transition, absolutely crucial. Um, the other step forward, I think, was the strengthening of the agreement on methane. It's now 150 countries. Yeah. And methane, such a powerful global warming gas, 60 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, but stays in the atmosphere shorter time. So action on methane will have a much quicker effect yeah. on, on climate. So those were the two steps forward. The steps back, I think, had all to do with the oil and gas lobby and the watering down of some of the text and the, uh, you know, not strengthening our position on phasing, phasing yeah. down or phasing out. Uh, but it happens in a fight. It's part of the fight. <laughs> yes. uh, and, and the momentum is there. I think yeah. uh, th I really believe this transition is absolutely inevitable. Mm -hmm. And there will be winners and losers. And you just have to decide which edge of which part of history you want to be part of. Yeah. That's, that's a very clear, <laughs> clear yeah. outlook. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to start with a question online and, and, and then I'll give the floor to you. Um, but I, I, th this is a lovely question. How can we implement sustainability in the boardrooms of companies in times of recession, market decline and cutting budgets? Which, of course, is also uh, yeah. a reality, at least at this moment. Yeah. Yeah, I, there's a quote by Warren Buffett that I sometimes use. You know, he said, uh, you only know who's been swimming naked in the ocean when the tide goes out. <laughs> yes. and, and I think some companies are being exposed who said that they were committed to sustainability or ESG. or And, and the first thing they cut is, is that. Yeah. So I, I think partly it is a test of leadership. Leadership is always about the long-term strategic commitment while you know, being adaptive enough to make it through crises. And so, uh, you know, there are, there are lots of uh, short-term things we can do to, to save costs, eco-efficiencies, all of those things. But in the end, it is about remembering that uh, 
moving to a thriving world is an investment. And an investment means you stay strong in times, in tough times. Uh, that increases the loyalty of your workforce. Uh, you know, recruitment and retention of talent is one of the biggest, yep. biggest things today. And, and it's very costly. So, you know, you're going to save money uh, very shortly if you do that. Um, and, and, you know, those who are really smart about it start to position themselves in growth industries. And the growth sectors tend to be the sectors that are solving our big social and environmental yeah. problems. But I won't say it's not difficult, but it's the test of leadership. Mm -hmm. Leadership says, you know, we stand firm in the midst of a storm. Is there maybe also a difference in... Um uh, let's say the, the the sort of companies. Maybe is is it maybe easier for let's say a family-owned business to to change uh, its dynamics than it is for a listed company? Yeah, I mean for sure. If you if if you have shareholders, it's always going to be harder yeah, because yeah. of the short-term orientation of shareholders. But even there. If you have the leadership, like we saw under a Paul Pullman in Unilever, yeah, you saw examples. Eh? Yeah. One of the first things yeah. he said was, "I won't report quarterly yeah. anymore because it's the wrong incentive." And so the the best companies are being very clear that they have a long term strategy which they're going to stick to, and it's going to be better for the shareholders yeah. as well. And very um, courageous CEOs. But it is about uh, <laughs> that moral uh, courage yeah. that they need. But for sure, it's easier for, for private companies or family-oriented companies who anyway are thinking longer term and don't yeah. have that pressure. Yeah, makes sense. Eh? Okay, folks. The floor is yours. Who has a question or a remark to... Yes. One question about, about the same slide. Uh, would you please... Oh. Yeah, because for the folks at home. Hi. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's on. Okay. Um, on the same slide, you were talking about the leadership of, of, of the private sector, the NGOs, and, 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 and the beginning, and also the young leadership and, and the future. What is interesting is right at the bottom was uh, the social entrepreneurs, was right at the bottom. Which, how, how can we explain that sort of difference, of the, 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 the fact that the, the private sector was right at the top, but at the bottom were the social entrepreneurs? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I can't get into the heads of uh, everyone who took the survey. It's, it's an interesting result. Um, you know, maybe it's that uh, we haven't seen enough of the social entrepreneurs going to scale. So I think we've had, you know, decades of experimentation by social entrepreneurs. And for now, we haven't seen that many breakthrough to become the unicorn companies. Hmm. Uh, and, and maybe that's what we're looking for because there's so much urgency uh, that we really need the scaling. Uh, and, and so those companies do exist, but they still few and far between, but I'm guessing there. Uh, it's an interesting observation. Yeah, it's, it, it looks kind of paradoxical <laughs> because lots of social entrepreneurs, of course, ha have a very explicit social mission. Uh, but I can imagine yeah, the scale could be quite an important, uh, quite an important aspect. Yeah. yeah, I think it's also about mainstreaming. I think if we're going to get to where we need to get to, Yes, we need those that are completely purpose-driven and, and, and are only focused on the solutions, but they tend to be still small. Actually, what we need are the big incumbent companies to make this part of their core shift, mission. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's maybe where we're placing more hope yeah. because they have that leverage in the market still. Yeah, and social yeah. enterprises can then, of course, be a big source of inspiration. Yeah. yeah. John. Jan Raas from ABN Amro. Thank you, Wayne. Very inspirational. Actually, my brain is overflowing right now. <laughs> um, there's a proposed ban on ESG investing for pension funds in Virginia and Texas. ESG investing, uh, environmental social governance, uh, is very popular in Holland, also at ABN Amro Bank. But what's your view on the proposed ban for pension funds in these two, uh, should I say, conservative states in the US? But you know, you would expect them to do differently. Yeah. Well, firstly, I'd like to separate, and I will talk about it, what's going on in the United States on ESG and what's going on globally on ESG. There, there has been also in Europe a kind of focus on ESG, uh, accusations of greenwashing. Uh, you know, Deutsche Bank, one of their subsidiaries, mm. was got called out on this. Um, and, and I think that's a good thing. I, I think... 
it's not a new trend, right? I mean, ABN AMRO has been uh, involved in this, uh, it used to be called socially responsible investment, now ESG investment, for a long time. But the, it is maturing, and as it matures, we need to up the standard. We need to be more critical on what is actually included in those funds. And, and what we find is that still many of those funds are supporting what could be regarded as very uh, or less sustainable portfolios. Uh, so the standard needs to be raised and the transparency of what's in those funds needs to be also increased. There's also a little technical diff diff difference here. ESG is not the same as sustainability and thriving. Uh, so ESG tends to take the perspective of uh, risk to the company. And so uh, actually what we're interested in is risk to society and nature. And so we have to be careful with only taking the investor perspective or the company perspective on, you know, you could be a very polluting company, but if there's no legislation, nobody's going to force you, then maybe this is a low risk, but it's not good for society. So we need to also address that limitation of ESG. But what's happening in the United States is this is, I mean, so politicized. Uh, so unfortunately, I could generalize and say sustainability uh, almost anything progressive has been politicized now, whether you're Republican or Democrat. Mm -hmm. And the whole anti-ESG thing, not only is it politicized, but there is research to suggest that a lot of that is being funded by oil and gas in the same way that they funded to create con confusion on climate science. Uh, so it's a kind of divide and conquer thing that's going on there right now. So what I think is that I mean, we, we need to continue to fight. We need to say we, we don't want or need ESG to go away, ESG funds, ESG investment. We actually want to scale that. We need to improve the standards. Uh, we need to improve the transparency and the reporting. But, uh, you know, be up for the fight because especially there, it's become a political fight. But it's, uh, th this is also part of your, um, the, the six P's you presented with the performances. Uh, th th there's a lot of hassle with metrics that we, that we use and how, do, how we measure them and how we report them. That's true, and, uh, but, but very exciting what's going on there. I yeah. mean, we, we are getting to consensus and you know, one of the recent moves is that uh, many of these bodies are now being consolidated under the international accounting body so we will start to see the sort of uh, um, normalization and standardization that we've been looking for for, for many years now. Mm. Um, and and uh, so, you know, I think we're getting there on metrics. Yeah. Uh, and so this is probably also par part of divide. <laughs> it, it, you, need, divide. you need to, yeah, you need the confrontation to, to move ahead probably. Yeah. 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 Makes sense, eh? Are you happy, Jan? Yes. Yesterday I had a meeting with our Prime Minister and he's only listening to law. What is the, in the fight we have, we talk about, you talk about now, what is the role of law, court cases, in this case, to, to, to speed up? Mm. Yeah, very good question. Mm. You know, I think policy plays a huge role. Policy allows us to keep increasing the standard. Uh, and to level the playing field so that we're not reliant on just on the pioneers or just on those that are progressive. Right? And if we look at an EU context, actually EU Green Deal, I think is a very powerful law and there are many, many others we could point to. Um, so the law is important, but I think it is also the way uh, to, to challenge governments to hold them accountable and we start to see that, I mean, here in, in the Netherlands especially, you know, the government also gets taken to court for not going far enough, not living up to the, to the law. We get, uh, you know, organizations like Client Earth that actually use the law in order to push governments to go further. So, you know, I, I think the law is important. It plays a very crucial role. But the law should only reflect the norms of society. And so we have to keep pushing for more even on the law. And the law isn't equal everywhere. And so there are some countries and some regions where the law is less effective. Simply they don't have the capacity to enforce it uh, or this corruption. And so there you need other mechanisms, you need social movements, uh, you need business. Uh, so it really depends on the country as well. 
So, so there, there's, a, there's a lot of ecology in, in, your, in your message, which makes perfect sense, of course, if, if you take uh, thriving as a starting point. Um, if we talk about uh, law, wh what do you think of initiatives like Ecocide and the Nature Right uh, movement, wherein uh, nat natural object gets human-like uh, rights? Do, do you think that is fruitful? Is that moving in the right direction? I think it helps. It definitely helps, and we get that in different parts of the world. You see some of that in New Zealand. You see it in Ecuador yeah. and so on, where, where nature be, ha, has rights, uh, constitutional rights. Uh, the problem, if we don't have that, is that we always trade off, uh, and that's what we've been doing for all of the Industrial Revolution. And if, if you look at any company now, what they're basically doing is creating economic and often social value at the expense of ecological yeah. value. So if, you, if, if nature ne never has rights uh, or never has a sort of legal protection, it's always going to get a value of zero. Yeah. When we know that its value is probably infinite because we're entirely dependent on nature, but we don't act that way because our institutions haven't kept up with, with that fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is that also part of your uh, uh, eco-service uh, economy that you described, that we, that, we, that we also measure the value of uh, ecosystem services? Yeah, I think it helps. Not, not everything can be measured, no. right? But, but in attempts to measure you know, how much our ecosystem services like climate regulation and water purification and poll pollination, how much are these worth? I mean, these are big numbers when they come out, multiple times the global GDP. So... I think they're, they're helpful in making us aware how valuable nature is, yeah. economically as well as, as socially, because we, you know, over a billion people are dependent on, on the ocean, for example. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's important for, for awareness. But on the other hand, I, I worry about turning everything into a financial measure, because some things we need to value because we understand yeah. that they're valuable not because, you know, uh, we put a financial value to them. No, there's, there's such a thing as respecting intrinsic value as well. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which which is hard in an economic debate, I know. Yeah. Um, I would like to continue with another question we have uh, from the online uh, folks. Uh, interesting question as well. What kind of jobs or skills will be the most important to contribute to the transition? So we know we have bullshit jobs, eh? Graeber. <laughs> Uh, so what will be, what are the thriving jobs in your opinion? Yeah. Well, I mean, I could literally go through those six transitions and you can find jobs in all of those yeah. areas, right? So anything that's helping us to protect and restore nature, anything in the circular economy. Um, I mean, you know, I talk uh, in the book, one of the things I talk about is having materials brokers. I mean, just having people that can match waste to uh, to, to raw materials that, that can make that link. Um, but then in the whole diversity and inclusion area, we need, we need lots of work there. In, in the health sector, we need huge amounts of work. I do a lot of work with Johnson & Johnson. It's very exciting what they're doing. But one of the things they recognize is they need to invest in uh, you know, disease prevention, not only disease treatment. So there's a whole emerging area in you know, health promotion uh, that, that needs to happen. And then there's the whole tech field. And, and there we, you, you know, it's so exciting, fourth industrial revolution, all of that. But we, we, what we really need are people that make sure that technology really s helps us solve the social environment problems, doesn't make them worse. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had 150 years where technology has actually been negative for certainly environmental impact, sometimes social impact as well. And, you know, of course, we get, uh, you know, a quarter of jobs today at high risk of automation as well. So, um, you know, people who, can, who understand and can work with technology and make that part of the solution. And then so many things around, uh, you know, the risk economy, as we call it. Huh? How do we help people survive and thrive through crises, whether that's working on, you know, earthquake resistant buildings or emergency response or insurance, you know. I've been told by, uh, you know, heads of sustainability for the big insurers in the world that climate change is uninsurable today already, right? We need creative solutions to this, the financing of these things. Um, 
So just so, so many. Uh, I mean, some are, are very fast-growing sectors, like clean tech is obvious. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, plant-based foods is growing like a rocket. Uh, there are some really obvious ones, but yeah, so, so many things. What, what, what do you think will be the, the main consequences for financial institutions? We're here, we're guests at a bank here. Well, I, I think financial institutions also face a huge credibility gap. Huh? They face a trust gap, maybe even bigger than the general business trust gap, because... Mm -hmm. They're still historically associated with funding uh, things that are destructive uh, yes. rather than uh, constructive. So they have a lot to prove. But what's very clear is, you know, when you have to completely transform an economy, which is what we have to do, getting to net zero is a fundamental transformation. The fact that during COVID-19, you know, in the first year, when everything was at standstill, emissions only went down by 7.5% shows you how deeply unsustainable our economy is. How do you make it sustainable? You have to invest and fund, you know, the solutions yeah. and that transition. I mean, it's massive. And so there's huge opportunity there. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's difficult, you know. Yeah. We're, we're in a wonderful circular building here. Uh, and, and also Antwerp Management School, we designed our campus to be very circular. But we found it really hard to get financing for that because it's a different kind of business yeah. model and the risks are different. So I, I think a lot of work needs to happen in finance. I wanted to just add one thing because you asked about skills. I, yeah. I, I had a very interesting thing revealed to me by a presentation on strategy we had from Port, Port of Antwerp, Bruges. And uh, they said to us uh, and to our students, they said, we are getting people who have all the right technical skills. They're qualified for the job. They should be our superstars. And the one thing they don't have is resilience. They can't cope with uncertainty. They can't cope with crises. Yeah. And so in terms of skills, sometimes it's what you might call soft skills, but really vital skills. And we're in such a disrupted world now. Yeah. You know, they said to me, uh, they used to plan on having a major crisis once every decade. Now it's once a year or maybe even more. <laughs> you know? once, a, once a day, I think. <laughs> and these are major disruptions, yeah. supply chains and other things. And, and so you need people who can yeah. deal with uncertainty, can adapt, can, can keep strong, can be resilient. So that's an interesting skill. Is this also something you, you noticed um, um, uh, with, your, with your students? Uh, so I work at the University of Applied Science and we have a strategy now to transform our uh, university into a change maker university. Yeah? So our board has acknowledged the fact that we can't just educate professionals that are capable to do jobs. But yeah. we also need to educate and enable them to be change makers because th yeah. they need these skills in to you know to make it uh, in tomorrow's uh, society. Yeah. Is that also something you come you come across in in the UK and in Antwerp? Yes, I mean uh, the the course I I run uh, jointly in in Cambridge is a business sustainability management course. It's an online course we've put through in the last four or five years, nearly twenty thousand students well. and. And, you know, this is what we're trying to equip them with, uh, is to be change makers. And often they're going back into their organizations or finding new roles. And we hear the stories. I mean, they are making an impact. So it's fantastic. At Antwerp Management School, what's interesting is we, we decided not to create a sustainability master's or program. We built it into every single ah, master's program. That's interesting. Whether it's in supply chain or, or uh, finance or uh, um, innovation. And they all have to do a course that we call Global Leadership Skills. And I think it's really interesting. There are three main components to that. One is societal consciousness, which is really strongly the, the sustainability piece. But the other two are interesting because the second is global perspectives. And what that means is we have to equip them to be able to work on diverse global teams. And we have 45 nationalities represented in the master's programs. And they have to learn how to deal with diversity. So that's really crucial. And the third pillar is self-awareness. Oh, so wow. they have to learn about themselves. What kind of leader are they? You know, what, do they have those skills to survive uh, disruption? 
Uh, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? So I think this is an interesting combination. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I guess everybody has to become a leader in these days. Eh? Well, this is uh, a little bit was my message also with the ant colony, right? And, and the flocking is uh, in complex living systems, everyone is a leader. Yeah. Everyone can step up. And the interesting thing with, uh, with a global system like we have is you never know if it's your action that could be that final tipping point that yeah. caused the whole system to change because it ripples through the system. Everything is so interconnected. And so uh, everyone really needs to step up as a leader in whatever their own context. So I often say to people, don't try to change the world. Whatever you do, do not try to change the world, but change your world. Yeah? just your sphere of influence. That's all you need to do, because your sphere of influence is connected to the rest of the system. And if everybody's doing that, you get those reinforcing uh, uh, feedback loops and the whole system changes. That makes perfect sense. Eh? Um, we, we're almost running out of time. Yeah, I, I, I see you, yes. But m maybe if, if there is one more question uh, from the folks here. Uh, yeah, yeah you're, you're very welcome, Jan. I've got one. <laughs> Microphone. Oh, thanks for the people at home. Um, there's a lot of discomfort, even amongst colleagues, with the resistance movement. And what I'm talking about is the people that are so desperate. In my view, they're so desperate that they glue themselves to paintings and mm. things like that. But there's a huge divided opinion on this. Could you share your view and maybe give us some pointers at, at like how how can we deal with it and also. I'm quite forgiving of these things, but like, it almost put the burden on me. <laughs> because people say, how can you tolerate such people disrupting all these things? Yeah. And I think it's just part mm. of, the, of the change, but maybe mm. you can add to this. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, we've got Extinction Rebellion and, and others, right? And I think they're absolutely part of the change. Yeah? And uh, what's interesting is this is, a movement that has studied uh, how major changes happened in history. And it's always been through civil resistance, often very inconvenient, uh, very disruptive, often illegal at the time. Uh, so I, I think th they're a necessary part of change. But again, if I reflect on that change in South Africa, what it in the end caused the change was all of the actors acting in their own way. So we had very radical people, anti-apartheid people, uh, you know, doing, uh, well, even getting involved in terrorist acts of blowing up things, and, and that was part of it. But we also had people who were peacefully resisting uh, all around the world. We had people disinvesting from South Africa. We had businesses staying and trying to change from the inside. So I think change is an accumulation of all of these things. What, what, the, what we might call those radical resistance activists do is, is raise the issue. They make us uncomfortable, um, but they, they should make us think because what all they're trying to say, a little bit like Greta, all she's trying to say is this is an existential crisis. And anyone who doesn't feel that urgency or that dread uh, doesn't get it. I mean, they, they, they're not really reading the science. Uh, and I think it's important to have that mirror held up to us. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, uh, let's say, forgiving or even embracing of, of that element of the change. But it's not the only element, because we also need those who are getting into partnerships, who are figuring out. I was just this week, uh, I just came from Germany. I was at the round table on responsible uh, soy. Uh, you know, and this is a multi-stakeholder forum that's trying to look at how do you make soy production sustainable in the same way that there's a round table on, on palm oil. These are part of the solutions as well, collaborative solutions as well as confrontational. We need all of it. And collectively what it must do is change the norms of society because as soon as it changes what we think is acceptable and what is normal and what is expected, all the institutions change to... To, to align behind that. So Jan, you have, sometimes you have to zoom out <laughs> and breathe in and breathe out. <laughs> no, but uh, it's systemic. 
Yeah. It is systemic, so you need all the you need all the actors eh, in this. Uh, yeah, I love the I love the fact that you, the accumulation. I think that that makes sense. Eh? So you need you need everything. Also the resistance, not only the um, uh, the resistance uh, against the uh, the oil company, but also the resistance by the oil companies. They yeah. are also part of the they're, they're part of the process. Yeah, and those working with them to help them change. Yes, so, yeah. hey, um, we ha sorry, we have to round up uh, because it's t it's 2015. But I, I just got in a, a wonderful question, which I think is made for the, to be the last question. Um, if you have, if you would have one slide to make the case for thriving versus traditional growth, what would be the main message on that slide? I think that's a wonderful roundup. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think the main message would be that in the end it comes down to are you having a strong purpose and you know one of my areas of work in fact my, my doctoral the thesis was all rooted in existential psychology and I think these issues we're dealing with are existential. I mean, both existential threats, but also existential in the sense that it's about the meaning in our lives. Why are we here? Why do we exist? What is the purpose of a human life? And then you can scale that up to what is the purpose of my organization or my community or my country, my city. And so I think, uh, you know, that's the essence, is to say that thriving, what it does is gives us a positive purpose uh, beyond sustainability because I think sustainability is not inspiring enough and is not ambitious enough. You know, there's that uh, saying, if you shoot for the stars, you might hit the moon. I think sustainability is shooting for the moon and barely getting off the ground. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, we, we need more ambition. And so make thriving that whatever element of it, whatever part of it most excites you, whichever of the transitions or the... We need all of it, but, but uh, let it be the thing that uh, energizes you. And that's the thing about thriving. It's life affirming. It gives you the energy you need yeah. to fight that good fight. It's positive. <laughs> thank you very much for, your, you. for your time and uh, wisdom. Thank Let's you give a, a round of applause for a very quick um, For the folks at home, Thanks uh, for watching and being part of uh, this uh, episode of uh, the, the uh, Circle College Tour. Uh, and uh, hopefully see you next month uh, for uh, another round. Bye-bye. <laughs>